Okay. So, um, I'm not going to do like Dennis yesterday, especially because I'm not going to summarize and to, to simulate uh, or to, to really badly understand my whole talk. <laughs> so, what I'm once going to do, and I'm not going also to try to, to summarize what, what speakers have said, I'm going to try to launch the discussion by trying to, to put a, maybe an exaggerated uh, imaginary dialogue between the different theoretical perspectives that we had this morning and, uh, and that we just had. So I think that the common point between all the talks we had uh, so far today is that um, yeah, there was a lot of theory. Uh, um, next to doing experiments with actual living beings in natural sciences, it's obviously uh, also extremely useful to try to, to direct those experiments with, uh, with theoretical uh, uh, hypotheses. Um, and one of the ways to, to do theory in those domains is by building machines. And those machines sometimes they can be abstract mathematical constructs uh, that we may play with in abstract problems or in simple simulated world. And uh, this activity I would call this uh, theoretical theory. Uh, and in some of the ways of doing this serialization is by not building abstract machines but uh, practical machines be made with algorithms that are running in actual robots facing the physical uh, constraints and limits of the world. And so uh, a number of the, of the aspects of the talks you, you heard involve those robot experiments and this is what I would call a practical theory. And um, based on, on, on these different perspectives, I think that sometimes the perspectives of these different ways of doing theories uh, are as asking questions to each other. So, for example, if we take the, the physicist perspective, which I think uh, is uh, expressed by, uh, by, by Karl, and obviously, like Denis, maybe I, I am misunderstanding and so don't say it that <laughs> to, to say I, I am completely wrong. But so, uh, to me, this perspective is trying to, to ask the question okay, what, can I find a general, unified, ideally simple principle for deriving automatically? Uh, the, 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 the mechanisms being what we call exploration, learning, and inference. Uh, it's, it's, in a way, it's about a bit like trying what is the Schrodinger's equation of exploration, learning, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and inference. Uh, and, and, and obviously, this has shown to be an extremely powerful method in, in for many questions of, of physics. Uh, but then, uh, when the, the roboticist is, uh, is looking at this from the point of view of playing with practical things, uh, then uh, one question is, Okay, but what is the underlying motivation for thinking that there might be one single universe, unified principle instead of a bunch of heuristic principles that were selected by evolution and by the way as the world is continually changing they are not optimal, they are just good enough to be yet there uh, in biological organisms. So like how can we play with this, this other perspective, how we can reconcile with you? Uh, and then, if we really take this, the, 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 the physicist perspective and we say, okay, uh, I'm convinced by the idea, but now in practice, uh, how can I use it to actually have my robots do practical things in difficult tasks in the real world? Uh, and then, probably by discussing with the physicist, what we will probably agree at some point is that, okay, because of the computational and physical constraints of the machine, we need to have a little bit of hacks. Uh, approve what the physics, the physicists might call this approximate methods, but these are hacks. Uh, and what is the importance of those hacks? Is this like a little detail that we need to understand, or is it really fundamental? Like, if you want to understand real living beings, this is I think one of the questions that, that that comes from the different aspects. Then maybe somewhere uh, there is also the Bayesian perspective. So maybe not. Uh, the physicist that, that, that tries to, 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 pin, to pin down the, the, the great unified principle, but okay, you can take the Bayesian perspective and say, okay, we can discuss many alternative theories, but whatever those theories, I'm going to be able to express them using the mathematical language of probabilities, or it could be the information theorist, and I'm going to want to express if all the theories that are possible and that we are discussing based on measures of uh, information, like mutual information. And so, here again, the roboticist said, okay, well, good, uh, it seems to be a nice, well-polished organism, but uh, 
Okay, for example, with all these theories, I have priors that are appearing in the equations. Uh, how do I come with, with good priors for my, my robots? They come from where? And, and in the model, I mean, what, what does it mean for, for the target child or animal I am doing? And also, okay, the roboticist, in his practical experiment with robots, uh, facing the, the, the high dimensional continuous spaces of, uh, of, of the world, of his body, he says, okay, but if I want to compute probabilities, how do I do that? Because most of the events in the world, actually, they are very rare, most of them. They are never time, never twice the exact same event in the world. And, and they are defined in uh, complicated spaces. So he's asking the mathematician, so what, what do I do? Well, uh, but the mathematician does not give the answer, but he says, Okay, but you need a well-defined and observable space of possible events with not too many dimensions. Okay, so the roboticist says, well, I don't have this. So well, my dimension is you, so, okay, I will work with empirical measures of prediction errors. So how bad is it or how good is it? Uh, yeah, another perspective, maybe, uh, uh, well, I, I call that the account of perspective, but maybe I could have found another name which I think is, was expressed by some of the arguments of Peter Dayan, which is to say that uh, many of you people are thinking about specific mechanisms uh, to call curiosity or intrinsic motivation for driving exploration, but why do you need all these set of fuzzy concepts if we can explain many forms of exploration as a side effect of complex learning strategy that maximize traditional extrinsic rewards? Good point. There again, the roboticist says, yes, you're right in theory, but in practice, when I want to build my learning algorithms for my complicated problems by embedded machines, it doesn't work. I need to put those hacks, and among the hacks that are extremely useful to solve the problems are these uh, measures uh, of uh, information gain or novelty or progress to drive exploration. So again, we come back to the question of the importance of the hacks. Um, and so then the roboticist continues and he says, okay, whatever, even those acts that are about driving active exploration by maximizing novelty, surprise, and progress in practice, I've played with hundreds of them. They are not enough. You need other mechanisms to drive exploration because, for example, it is very costly to estimate where you can find novelty, surprise, or learning progress. So how do you do? Then you play with many mechanisms and you come up, okay, there are other constraints like for example, the fact that the body is growing with time, that the perceptual apparatus is maturating, there is low, for example, visual, uh, spatial and temporal resolution, which is limiting the set of things you can perceive and consider. The, the, the number of the, the spatial temporal resolution of your muscle apparatus is also growing with time, so your motor space is physically growing with time. This is constraining and this is very helpful. And then there is obviously social guidance. The robot, if you make it you know, with a, even with a non-engineer, non-specialist human, is going to be able to drive the attention of the robot on very important things that are going to really allow him to find the sources of, of our learning progress. And then there is the developmental psychologist who comes in and he says, I told you you should have looked at what infants are doing. Okay, but so let's go back to what you were doing initially, theory. How do I how can we use all this theoretical stuff in my practical everyday experimental world? What is the impact? How, what, what does it change? Okay, so you see many questions, and so now please, uh, those of you who, were, who thought I expect, uh, I expressed uh, uh, an inaccurate perspective can express, and so questions or remarks?
So it's, uh, I think it's an okay thing to call all your stuff hacks or heuristics. It would make me a lot happier if you called them prior beliefs. Uh, because as soon as you call them prior beliefs, I can put them into an equation and I can provide you the, the normative optimization scheme. Because to, to specify useful prior beliefs, you have to have specify the form of generative model. And I think the key point I want to make is that time and time again, the importance of a hierarchical structure to these generative models is emerging implicitly in every, every presentation. So it was a last slide of Peter's talk. It was implicit in that movie evolutionary demonstration that you can actually learn reward functions. Now for my talk, the, one of the key messages was reward is a prior a log of prior probability. So that means in a hierarchical context, you're just talking about hierarchical prior. So priors are learned. Priors can be optimized in a by approximate Bayesian inference, which means rewards can be optimized in relation to variation free energy in a hierarchical context. And all the hacks that you're talking about and the plurality of different sorts of prior beliefs, the multi-dimension aspect, is just a reflection of the of the, of the implicit hierarchy that you're bringing to the table. So I, I, I think that's an important insight that there is no one fixed reward function, reward, fun reward functions is prior beliefs, and they are inherited from the hierarchical level above. So ultimately that means you need to cast evolution in terms of Bayesian model selection. You need to absorb evolution into exactly the same framework and everything else unpacks from that. So in conclusion, I, I would say that it's our job, people like me, how to go and find out why your stuff is working and understand very much like the notion of the uh, reverse reinforcement model, Re reverse engineer the implicit underlying hierarchy objective model so that we can talk to each other without having to use those like hats and heuristics. Yeah. So I'm quite happy with the notion of hats and heuristics, like I said it. So uh, I think that you're quite right that we need um, to understand this link to theory theory and um, But I think part of it is that you're designing your heuristics because you're also designing the environments in which your heuristics operate. Right? And so, you know, so the, the task that we have with the academic, I think, with the my slides is that we have to understand something more about rhythm environments and therefore the, the heuristics that work well, so the priors that work well in the class terms are ones that work well for, 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 for real environments. And of course we can always design environments where we can really speed up learning because we provide exact heuristics which were in our mind when we design the environment and we then put them in bodies too. I think the issue for Carl though is that um, it's fine to put some of these things into priors, but when you get to the point of bounded inference, so the fact that in fact doing the computations that are required for Bayesian reasoning uh, is actually becomes essentially then that's no longer a prior, that's something that has gone wrong essentially with your calculation method. Now, of course, we can then say, well, let's therefore optimize ourselves relative to the complexity of calculation as well. But we know well, and we just remember a lot of lunch time, we know well that that's, that's even more complicated than it is to try to do regular optimal control. And so then I think we are forced to have real facts and heuristics. We're not, we, we, they're not equivalent to using priors in a well formed sense, but we simply can't do those computations. So you know, it's kind of Paul's perspective on, on how we get around this condition. Uh, more simplistic view from a development of psychologist perspective, but the, the same sort of thing. Like a lot of the theoretical models don't take or don't appear to take immediately capacity limitations in development of views, um, and you have to um, construct hacks to get around it. Um, or one additional thing to think about in view is the extent to which those capacity limitations are changing so that the hacks are not constant either. Um, and that's something you need to think about. So what's driving curiosity at six months, the day we can decide what curiosity is. Um, what's driving at six months may not be what's driving at five years or 20 years or whatever, it depends on other cultural factors, which are environmental factors, knowledge-based factors, but also capacity factors in, in the individual.
just responding to, to that point, uh, and also addressing the, the, um, the third, your third question. So the, the notion of hacks and the bounded rationality, I think that's absolutely crucial as well. Uh, and I would celebrate that. You know, so the difference between being fully Bayesian and approximate Bayesian is the difference between optimizing your surprisal or optimizing your variation free energy. And the variation free energy is a functional of beliefs. So the very, if you like, happiness, the very boundedness, the very um, uh, acknowledging the real world constraints of being approximate base of influence, I think, I think brings something to the table quite fundamental. It makes your behavior a function of beliefs or representation, which you wouldn't otherwise need. So I think it's absolutely crucial. You said, ah, oh, physicists would call them approximations, you're absolutely right, but they would call them <coughs> approximations. But they are very revealing, we feel, approximations, in the sense that they, there are good ways of carving out the world and marginalizing your representations, and there are bad ways. And if you look at the brain, the whole principle of functional segregation, and indeed if you look at your robots, the very fact that you modularize and partition various functionalities, so something quite profound about the, uh, about the nature, the goodness of a mean field approximation. And as a sort of technical response to Peter's challenge, there is always a way of scoring the goodness of your approximation, your mean field approximation, which is what one of the other, an example, and a fundamental example of a hack or a heuristic, that's the variation of the energy. So the structure learning problem applies to the hack and to the boundedness. And that practically get, comes around, I think, when you ask the question, well, what does that perspective give you practically as a hypothesis? So you can now go and get off the shelf advances in Bayesian model selection and structured learning to actually optimize the very structure and form and the wirings and all the hacks that you've hitherto crafted by design. I mean, again, coming back to, to you know, the previous talk, the use of jetty algorithms is one device to do that. But if you actually now put, replace the, um, the adaptive fitness with a variation of the energy, you would now end up with an entirely self-consistent approximate base in Bayesian scheme in which your hacks themselves have now been optimized. I do believe that one point has been left, uh, left out of the discussion, which I think is very important, I do believe that yes, space plays a very important role because I don't think that evolution has the opportunity to reinvent the wheel every time. So the hacks, yeah, some the maybe small hacks, I don't think you can come up with a really great idea many times in evolution. So I think there are some simple principles behind it, maybe Bayesian uh, inference and uh, informational search, etc. But I think embodiment is absolutely central. In other words, the fact that we live in a physical world which is comparatively simple. Comparatively simple, I'm going to just one example. 3D space is an extremely well organized space to move in. It gives us a lot of prior knowledge, a huge amount of prior knowledge, free. Uh, there are ways to make it precise. And I think that the fact that this is possible is not trivial at all. Uh, you can imagine universes where this doesn't work very well. Uh, you can imagine universes which are like mazes where essentially no global knowledge can be derived by knowing your local environment. This is not true for R3. R3 tells you locally how the world works at the distance of Andromeda Nebula, more or less. Uh, if it's not good enough, then you go to Minkowski space. But essentially, that you can do this prediction on huge distances in time and space. I think that is something we have to understand because it plays a role in my opinion. And the second thing that I think we will have to understand at some point is how is it actually implemented in physics, the computation? So the first steps going from thermodynamics, moving to the first steps of cognition, why is it actually possible to climb that level of cognition, that level of decision making, uh, in a way that is not stuck some point at um, Tom Ray's Tierra uh, hyper parasites? I mean, if you look at Tom, Tom Ray's Tierra, it's brilliant. It gets stuck. Physics doesn't get stuck, the question is why. I do believe that the world has a moral structure and we utilize it to great effect. And that together, embodiment, let's call it embodiment in our case, 
that together with the um, preemption principle or innovation principles, I think, needs to be understood. As a computer scientist, um, the idea that theory is at the top and then decides how the experiment should go, it's a bit funny because in reality what happens you know, in AI uh, very often is first the experiments will try something like a hack or heuristic that isn't justified by theory. And after the fact that theorists will come in and say, wait a minute, this is actually principle, we should actually look and try to understand how this works. So I still want to challenge this question. Maybe, maybe actually, it doesn't have to be that we first do the theory, and once we understand the theory, we then do the experiments. I think in many ways the, the hacks that work are going to inform the theory. Yeah. So I, I don't know. If I, I I didn't want to say that uh, theory needs to come before experiments. Uh, in practice, it's it, it, it's always messy, of course. <laughs> it goes in all directions, and, and in this kind of scientific. Uh, epistemology, things are even more messy because there are two kinds of experiments. There are experiments with living beings and there are experiments with machines. And, and we learn quite different things and, and, and between the two. And so theory is, is somewhere in between and there are experiments with different epistemological functions on the, on the two sides. So that's, yeah. So, I see that uh, <coughs> one, one, one uh, aspect for which hat models uh, have some advantage with respect to principal models is that they can scale up easier. So, for example, we have the example now, we have the example on artificial intelligence of deep neural networks, and then they are kind of a bunch of hacks, but they're very powerful, they scale up to very complex problems. Uh, and I see that on the other side, um, from the theoretical approaches, they have a problem to scale up as soon as you increase the, the number of the dimensions and uh, the inference becomes impossible in practice. So, uh, do you think that this is just a technical problem? One day we will uh, have good approximations and we can uh, approximate very well your, uh, your models and so they, are, they, they will scale up? Or do you think that your models should be used to understand, but you wouldn't claim that the brain or robots should work in the way that your models say they work? I don't know if I'm clear. So, are your theories a tool to understand and not uh, something that you claim is actually there in place in the brain? Or you think that your models actually built in the, in the brain, even if in a simplified, approximated way, for example, with particle filters instead of full distributions and uh, canonical distributions and so forth. So I think this is a useful distinction between the normative theory here, and sort of your high church, the physicist theory, the description of what the system is doing. And the necessary process there is that are under, underneath them. So there are 101 ways that you can, uh, depending on the objective model, minimize variation of the energy, the can filter, you can do it with MCMC. So all of these are potential processes by which you comply with the normative theory. So I think that, again, as a scientist and as uh, somebody working, say, with logics, it would be best to distinguish between the process and the actual energy theory. But to answer your question, yeah, yes, I do believe that the brain does minimize variation of energy. But more than that, if it didn't, I believe it wouldn't exist. It's almost tautological. So um, what's the purpose of it? Well, the purpose is not really to, uh, to provide an alternative model. It's really, I think, it's, as you intimated in the question, that you, you said actually very explicitly, the purpose is to uh, almost provide a forum within which you can reverse engineer what actually works. So the question usually reduces not to is the principle right or wrong? The principle is almost tautologically right. The question is to what generative model is it applying? And what does that say about the art of the robot that's navigating a mercenary environment? And what about 
the, the agents generally implicit in generative model, if we can reverse engineer it, part of that would be the price, and part of that would be the reward functions, and hence the importance of um, inverse reinforcement learning. What does that say about the environment at this point in development of, uh, for, for that particular agent? And this is a final comment to come back to a, a, a point that Peter was making as well. Practically, that notion of reverse engineering the underlying generative model, that entails all the prior preferences and the, uh, the hierarchical rewards or the five functions that we just heard about. The fact that you want to do that or the fact that that can be done is very important from the point of view of uh, things like psychiatry, computation psychiatry. You can phenotype a person in terms of their implicit prior preferences and their prior beliefs and their generative model and all their hats and their meaningful approximations, you've got a functionally very precise and potentially very important way of classifying and understanding the way that the, the brain goes wrong when making poor synthesis and things like schizophrenia and all so. And so what about the, the scalability barrier? How do you expect that you're going to overcome the problem of scalability in practical terms in robots or well, in practical how it happens in, in the brain? So in practical terms, from my perspective, this is a statement of what is principle of least action. So remember that the action is intelligible. So any machine that minimizes free energy quickly will conform to Hamilton's principle of least action. That would be quite something quite fundamental. So if you want optimal performance, that implicitly has to be done quickly with minimum expenditure or energy by Mandela's principle. So there are lots of theoretical sort of um, Consistencies with perhaps that work and that scale and the underlying normative principle. So, this is not about a really lazy and best estimate of what is going on and what to do. It's actually finding the trajectory of a real function of time that minimizes the time integral of both your informational and your thermodynamic energy expenditure. So, the scalability argument actually falls back into the normative principles, and it's a real challenge. So I'm not saying I have a model that can do stuff. What I'm saying is that your models that can do stuff that do scale tell me something quite profound about the worlds in which those uh, the, the worlds for which those models are fit for purpose, almost by definition. I'm not surprised that this is a cognitive neuroscientific conference that focuses on rational thoughts and. Uh, beliefs which are construct, basically cognitive constructs, but I'm surprised at the total lack of consideration of any affective components or emotional components or even mentioning affect in terms of human function. So I, I think um, there are several dimensions of your question. I think for a number of people here, um, this dimension is very important, but, but is a bit uh, hidden behind words like motivation. Uh, yet, there is something I think very important that you say, which is like, for example, in the current discussion that we are having, um, indeed, some of for example, the theories that we are speaking about uh, are based on the kind of the assumption that we can understand the brain as a system which is optimizing something uh, with mechanisms that are, that are very good for all properties that are rational, that you know, that are. And indeed, it is a, I think it is an open question. I don't know what Carl you, you think about. For example, you said earlier that indeed this framework is, 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 uh, is, is within uh, uh, optimal Bayesian uh, uh, thinking. Or, um, Peter talked about the theory of optimal control. And here we, we, we try to find what is the optimal solution or the optimal mechanism to, to a given problem. It might be that uh, real organisms are not optimal in any meaningful way, uh, maybe it's completely wrong, but for example, in, indeed emotional processes might, might have a non-rational uh, role and then how can we take it into account? Can we reintegrate it into a normative framework where everything is rational and there is a function of emotion, etc.? What do you think? Well, I think, for example, the self is, and the self
of bias is very critical to the way we think, and that would be part of the equation. Probably the concept of self is too far away from uh, our concept of curiosity and so on and so forth, so it's difficult to link. No, it's related. If I can uh, try to comment on the last question, uh, so how could we move those theories of practical consequences, which links a bit, a bit I think, to the concern for applicability, emotions? Um, so I have the feeling that uh, today, we, so in the, this morning, we've been uh, a bit considering like, can we remove reward and emotions and just turn all behavior into getting information, like a bit in this uh, free energy framework, or can we get rid of information seeking and reduce everything to uh, reward seeking? Um, and maybe the hack uh, discussion is about maintaining the two and acknowledging that uh, evolution creates modules which are useful uh, for some purpose and that the mind is modular and not organized according to a central principle as the physical uh, world. But, uh, so it's just a more general one, but about it resonates with this question because I wonder why exactly we are curious about curiosity. Are we curious about curiosity because we want to minimize our uncertainty about human behavior in general? Or do we want to improve some reward function, some utility function in the world around us. And I have the feeling that uh, if education is the purpose or even of this conference, if we want to go out of this conference with some new ideas on how to better educate, how to better stimulate curiosity, maybe some theories are better suited than others to act on curiosity. And there might be theories in which uh, curiosity is necessarily a byproduct of learning, and there is no way in those theories to really act on curiosity. And maybe in other types of theories, there is a way to uh, suggest that there is actions to be made, and if so, which ones? Uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah. and basically, this, uh, this, I think here we enter in the, a different debate as compared to the purely theoretical one. But it yeah. just, which theories so, might work? Yeah, something that's very related to what you just said is that in, in the current discussion, it's mostly people doing uh, computer science or mathematics or physics who are discussing. Uh, very little of the psychologists and neuroscience here are making comments or asking questions. And maybe there is a reason, or several reasons, and I don't know which one. Um, maybe the, those theories are too remote from the experimental concerns that psychologists and neuroscience are facing. Maybe, maybe there is a fundamental problem of, of language in the sense that we just don't understand each other because there is a very different terminology and we negotiate this terminology even before we talk about the, these, these theories. Maybe because theories, as they are discussed like this, they are not falsifiable with the practical, practical experimental tools in the labs. Yeah, so, okay, so Mara, for your discussion, <laughs> no, this is an excellent uh, question. I mean, I, okay. I really I think this is an make... important question. And so, just, um, just a second. I, I was going to say that we have another discussion after the afternoon session, which is all about experiments. And so I think I'd like to take that up. But maybe one, one but just, last comment. Just one last comment on the yeah. question. It's just um, picking up the point 